Hi everyone, this is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I'm very excited today to have three guests from the International School of Amsterdam. We have Shannon Hancock, who's a middle years program English teacher at the school. And then we have a couple of students, uh, Trinab and Rania, who have joined us today. And uh, these are our first student guests on the series, so very excited about that. So Amsterdam friends, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what has the shift to uh, post-pandemic learning and teaching look like there? Um, well, thanks for having us. We, um, we went on distance learning March 16th, and, um, and we are a one-to-one -one school, so it was pretty instant. I mean, we got the call from the government on a Friday, and we started DL on Monday. So that shift was very, very intense and Full. Um, we certainly haven't done everything right. If I, I, I think a lot of us in education wish we could do it again, you know, if we could start this all over again. Um, but I think it, in terms of our faculty, um, we've been asking some really important questions in terms of distance learning because we're basically running our full IB program, but in the DL model, which I think is pretty ambitious. Um, but we really wanted to know um, what were the key things and skills and concepts that we really wanted kids to leave the grade with. Um, we've talked a lot about social and emotional health, which I think is really important in this model. Um, we've talked a lot about community building and how to build a community in this virtual world um, and stay connected. And then I think in terms of teachers, and, and maybe you guys have seen this, uh, really thinking that we can't teach in the same way. So how are we going to reimagine our teaching practice? So I think a lot of us that wanted to do like a flipped classroom but never found the time or wanted to set up Google Groups or Meets or whatever, um, well, we have this time now. We have to do that. And so um, and we have at ISA, and I think people across, around the world have too. And I keep thinking that even though this has been a really stressful time for, for educators and students and parents, um, there's some really nice things that have come out of it in this pressing of us to reimagine the way we do things. So I think that's some of the cool things that have happened here within our faculty. Cool. So, Trinav and Rania, talk to me a little bit about what does your typical school day look like now, right? I mean, you just sit in front of a camera all day? <laughs> um, so, we've kept uh, our schedules the same. So, we just start class at 9 o'clock and we have hour-long classes um, and we keep uh, the periods the same. So, uh, my first class will always be my first class on every day, uh, every Monday, and we go through uh, the cycle Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. We skip Wednesday and have that as an independent learning day. Um, so it's been interesting, I think, um, particularly online, uh, there's, the, um, there's the feeling that we can sometimes do more work than we can do in class, uh, but at the same time, there's that sort of learning curve you have to get used to in terms of being able to talk online and interact with your teachers online, so that's been a little challenging at times. And another difference is that we've divided up some of our classes into synchronous learning and asynchronous learning, where synchronous learning is like what we're doing right now, we're almost simulating a classroom environment, uh, which is more, more often than not the first three periods of the day, and then we have two periods of asynchronous learning. Um, it's, it's been interesting. All of our teachers have been you know, using technological tools that some of them didn't really have the bravery to deal with <laughs> before. And in certain cases, I think it's been a struggle, but one that we've like, struggled through together. So in a way, it may, may have even enhanced our feeling of community. Okay, so you have this midweek pause, which uh, I think you called it an independent learning day. So what happens then? Um, so it's supposed to be used for uh, <laughs> catching up on work um, that you haven't done in the week or that you know you have to do that's been assigned already. It's like a big study hall. Yeah, it's yeah. one long study hall period. Um, so sometimes if I have per week more assignments than I normally would, uh, I budget that time and I use that. But other times, sometimes it's just a good day just to relax and. Uh, because this is, a, this is a stressful time um, in terms of emotional uh, and social interactions, especially because we have restrictions on movement um, still. So that day kind of, kind of becomes like a relaxing day. You can talk to friends online um, with more freedom than you could on a normal school day. Gotcha. 
So one of the things I've noticed in a lot of schools here in the United States is that while they might have been making some moves to what we might call deeper learning uh, with students where you get a chance to maybe do some more projects and inquiry and be more critical thinkers and problem solvers and use technology in some interesting ways. Um, once the pandemic hit, um, the easiest sort of instruction to get to students was more like homework-like stuff or worksheet packets. Um, and so they're sort of like they kind of reverted back to some of the lowest, maybe most boring kind of learning, you know, possible. Now, you all are trying to keep a full-blown IB program up and running. So how have you managed to hang on to some of those hallmarks of the IB program, some of that really deep, rich thinking and learning work, uh, even though you're at a distance? I think we've just used... Um some teachers have really encouraged us to keep up with the in uh, small group discussions that are really a hallmark of our regular classes and that sort of like maintenance of the learning community has really helped with things like critical thinking and um the sort of key concepts of collaboration that we always emphasize yeah and i think um things like Flipgrid, I don't know, Flipgrid's become really yeah. popular, um, but to build community and also to ask an inquiry-based question and then have kids be able to respond and then collaborate and then comment on each other's. So things like that, that I think a lot of us um, uh, tried to figure out, well, I would normally do this in a discussion, what's that gonna look like? And at first it seemed really scary, but then once we set up our Google Meet groups or however we were gonna do it, um, we realized, oh, this can work. This actually works pretty well. And the only thing I think we've struggled with is the amount of content, you know, that kids, um, and we're surveying kids all the time um, because it, I, what I find is the work um, productivity is actually going down. It's not getting better, it's going down, which makes a lot of sense without a, the stimulation of the, of the classroom. And so, um, just really dialing it back. And what do we actually want these kids to go to the next grade with? Um, but I think in terms of inquiry, um, using text tools has been just fantastic in continuing discussions and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Um, so one more quick question, and then we'll slide into sort of our second half of our conversation. Uh, you know, obviously we all were forced into this distance learning modality. Um, all across the world, but what are some things that have sort of emerged over the last couple of months that you hope will continue whenever we get to come back face to face? That's a good question. Um, I think from a social standpoint, I think there's a lot more uh, mingling online of people who maybe you don't interact with so much in the class, but because of the necessity of distance learning, you have to work with them in order to um, get an assignment done or to successfully uh, achieve a learning objective. Uh, so I hope that maybe when we come back, whether that's this school year or next school year, um, that that sort of sense of community still exists. And I think we've like, in between my classmates and I, we've all become more cognizant of each other's emotional health. Everyone's much more solicitous of each other and like reaching out continuously to make sure that everyone's doing okay and that connection isn't becoming frayed. And I think it's actually something we should keep up when we come back because we take that for granted sometimes. Yeah, and I would add just risk taking, like as a faculty member of this incredible faculty where teachers have been teaching for many, many years um, and are just great at what they do. This has pushed them to take risks again. And I think that's a really healthy thing. And to realize that they can take a risk and it can bomb and <laughs> fail. And the kids actually, I think, really respect that in their teachers to see that we're all kind of in this together and that teachers are pushing themselves to try new things. I think that that's been a beautiful thing for teachers to realize they don't have to have all of the answers. Kids, those, even the smartest kids, they don't need us to know everything. It's okay. And I think that's been really healthy at our school. I hope we continue that after DL ends. That's awesome. So I understand you have this amazing project happening called Stories That Move, and it's been maybe particularly relevant in some ways during the pandemic. So uh, let's spend a few minutes. Tell us a little bit about the project and uh, wh why you think it might have some particular salience uh, at the moment. So Stories That Move is this um, online toolbox for education against discrimination that uh, Trinav and I 
particularly have been working with since we were in eighth grade testing the tool um it's basically aimed at eradicating prejudice from the minds of youth through the perspective of stories rather than throwing statistics at you it's about showing you people who are suffering or and uh sort of going through things and still holding themselves up and listening to their particular stories so that you can relate to them at a human level and perhaps that can serve as an opening to reduce discrimination and prejudice in our world um Trinab and i started working with it in eighth grade and we actually attended the sort of opening of the duel at berlin in 2017 2017 2018 yeah. one of those the summer before we started ninth grade yes. and since then we've also had a cast club creativity action and service here at school where we try to sort of raise awareness about the tool and through our sort of social advocacy and awareness projects that we try to do ourselves to sort of propagate the ethos of the um, tool itself and so uh, all you need to access the tool is an internet connection um, it's completely free and it has very uh, meaningful, uh, like Rania said, stories of pe people who have just discriminated and have overcome um, them and have a story to tell about it uh, to inspire youth to make a difference. Uh, and that's sort of the mindset we went into when we were creating uh, these lessons, distance learning lessons for the uh, upper school, so grades six through 12, um, because uh, we were approached by our director who had spoken with uh, various members of the Asian community in Amstelveen and Amsterdam, who had experienced uh, certain um, discrimination and prejudice as a result of the coronavirus uh, in, in, in the city. And they were really concerned about that happening and they wanted uh, something, some, some action to be taken. And so we were asked to develop um, lessons that were simple to follow, but also meaningful. And so we took a lot of that from the toolbox itself. So we used stories, we used uh, humor as well. Um, but we used stories to really drive that message forward that the youth, one, can make a difference, and two, have the tools to be able to make that difference. And I think that's been pretty successful. Um, I think for the first time, it's really been students uh, in our club and at ISA who've been so thrown into this distance learning uh, mode and who've been able to make a difference by teaching other students the importance of respect cool. overall. So a couple of things I really like about this project. One is you're working with some authentic real world partners like the Anne Frank House, right, which is pretty neat. Um, but uh, another aspect of this is that instead of you all being recipients of lessons from your teachers, you're actually creating lessons for your teachers and for other students in the school. What has that been like for you and who's using these lessons? Yeah, that's been uh, pretty interesting. So uh, our club was first involved with creating. So we created a presentation and we used some online tools like Google Forms and Flipgrids to allow the students to interact with the lessons. Uh, and then we went through Ms. Hancock to have it approved as a teacher so that we could achieve all our educational goals and then had to have it approved by administration. So there were a few steps, we had hurdles we had to clear in terms of getting it approved. Um, but it's been exciting. I think student, uh, the student voice is particularly powerful uh, when we ourselves engage with the process. Uh, and especially, especially applying it to um, students in our school who we know as well. Um, and seeing that them mature and understand the issue as a whole itself has been pretty eye opening. I think there was some anxiety about like putting our names on it and then our, like our classmates being you know judging us yeah. or having opinions about it and we weren't above pandering to an extent there was there are tiktoks on the um on the lessons sometimes but <laughs> i think that that actually helps because we can relate to the to our classmates and we know what sometimes gets them going and some humor is always good in the mix yeah, and I, I would add that the Stories That Move project, it's a project with seven other European countries. There's universities and human rights organizations, and it's been happening in the process for about 10 years. But but where, the, where uh, Rania, Trinab, and then they have two partners, Zosia and Leilani, who also created this um, these lessons, um, where it comes in is that the whole project is about 
the adults stepping back and having the youth explain what's really going on. So when Trinob talks about the stories, those are stories of youth sharing what's really happening and their insecurities and things that they're, they've experienced in their life or to their family and where some of these prejudices might come from. And, and I think that, um, that, that I think some of our young people are really tired of the adults um, leading the conversation. And that's the whole IB way is to allow the kids to start leading this kind of dialogue. And I think with these two lessons, which by the way, if any of the people watching um, your stream would like them, they're totally available and on the distance learning um, uh, platform, you know, you can use them. But the whole idea is that the youth are leading the way. And I think we always forget, we think we have to control that conversation and we don't. In fact, the young people much prefer to have Trinab and Rania control the conversation. I shouldn't say control, open the conversation for real honest dialogue. So I think that's been one of the really nice things um, about the, um, the two lessons. And why don't you tell them what they cover, the two lessons? Ah, uh, yeah, so um, do you wanna? You can go. Okay, um, so our first lesson uh, was sort of the one we were trying to figure everything out, how to do it, how to plan a lesson for students. Um, and that covered discrimination, specifically addressing discrimination, understanding where it comes from, and how to tackle it. And in the context of the pandemic itself, how Asian communities have been targeted in many areas around the world, and right. trying to tell their stories from different media platforms and different media forms, and also encouraging sort of intermittent thinking about content that the students are consuming. Uh, and then our second lesson uh, was more geared towards media bias, so understanding uh, how students get their information themselves, so whether that's online via Snapchat or Instagram, um, or whether through traditional news sources, so uh, websites, news websites, reliable sources, and getting them to engage with the process to understand, well, what is this person saying? Do they have an agenda? Uh, understanding whether or not it's a reliable source, uh, so that they're more aware of what's going on in the world, but are aware that there can be people who want to misinform them um, or otherwise provide information that is not reliable. And we actually use sort of a historical angle on that one about different previous pandemics and people and communities who've been scapegoated for that pandemic or that epidemic and try to sort of have the people be reading and going through the lessons sort of see the pattern historically of this occurring and our club members who who are younger than us uh sort of they're in their high schoolers were actually really helpful in finding all of these different uh content pieces for the lesson cool we're kind of nearing the end of our time together Rania Trinab, i want to ask you one last question which is you know this work has sort of occurred sort of parallel to or outside maybe your regular classes what have you learned from working on this what skills do you think you've gained? Certainly, um, there's a lot of things you take for granted when you're working with people in person. Um, so because we had to do this all online and that included uh, allowing teachers um, access to the presentation uh, and the online tools and also ha troubleshooting with them. Uh, I think there's a certain level of cooperation uh, that I think we've both learned in terms of having communicating clearly what um, we've created, how to access it, uh, and really working together to create a cohesive uh, pair of lessons. And I think the four of us, Trinab, Zozi, Leilani, and I have become much more uh, target oriented because when we're together in like a physical space, we have the tendency to meander sometimes, but when we're on a Google Meet, we have to get it done. There are other con constraints. So yeah. I think we've become more efficient. Cool. Keenan, any observations from your perspective? Um, no, I mean, I think, I think, and also when you let youth develop lessons, um, they understand that there's an art to developing a good lesson, you know, that there's kind of a progression and all of that. And so I think they've, you guys have gotten really expert at figuring out um, how to develop the full lesson and also just on distance learning how um, you can't leave things, things can't be ambiguous, you know, you really, a student, especially with content like they're covering, it really needs to be airtight. And so there's a lot of fine tuning to make sure there's not misperceptions, misconceptions, when a child is at home going through this material that you want to be a really eye-opening experience. So I think 
they've learned, you guys have learned a lot with that. Yeah. And GDPR, because we have to be GDPR compliant and we've learned a whole lot about that too. So all of those things I think have been really great. And in terms of our school, just ISA, realizing that youth um, has this incredible voice and this untapped resource. And I'm really hoping that more and more schools around the world will see um, just the leadership in terms of curriculum development that we have in our classrooms. My eyes have been open to that. So there you have it, friends, some incredible stories of student voice, student agency, and uh, youth making a difference in the community around them. Thank you, ISA friends. I uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you Thank for you. having us.